So I'm like frantic, like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm about to poop on myself. So I squeeze my butt cheeks as tight as I possibly can. My skin is burning like fire. And I start getting like really aggressive like an animal. I'm like, <sighs> <sighs> and as soon as I give pushback to Mother Aya, she throws me into a haunted house with clowns chasing me. And I'm like, okay, 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 okay. I'll give her the $500. Like, get me the hell out of here, right? Today, I'm going to share with you my wild experience with Mother Ayahuasca over a three-day retreat, which was scary, blissful, and outright crazy at times. But would have to say that this has been the biggest catalyst for change in my life. And I'm not going to waste time talking about the retreat center, how the food was, or what is ayahuasca. The focus of this video is to share my experience so you can see how this medicine is a miracle maker and I actually had an experience so rare and unique that the author of this book asked if he could put my experience in his upcoming book which I said yes to. But you're going to hear about it today and it is going to literally blow your mind. So why did I decide to try ayahuasca? I was just tired of being the old me getting myself into the same situations, talking about change but not making a change, I felt as if I was starting to settle in life and was hoping that the medicine could help me get out that funk. So that was my intention going into the retreat. And it's recommended for you to always have an intention when you're planning to experience Mother Aya. So for example, what would you like guidance with in your life? Or what are you trying to work through? And the purpose of the intention is because she's going to be able to help you work through the situation that you're in and provide you with answers. But regardless of what your intention is, she's going to always give you what you need and not what you want. So 10 months ago, I experienced Mother Aya for the first time. And I purposely waited to share my experience because there's something known as the ayahuasca glow or the ayahuasca high that can last up to three weeks after sitting with the medicine where you're still in this euphoric state and everything about life is just great. And I wanted to allow time to pass to confirm the changes in my life actually sustain. Okay, so I'm about to go over my experience with you and some of this is gonna sound crazy as hell, but you're gonna see how it all comes together at the end, especially the part that's gonna be in the upcoming book. So the first day at the retreat, I drink the medicine in the evening in the maloka. And the maloka is where all the ceremonies are held. And I would say that the medicine tastes, tastes earthly, but it wasn't nasty. So I drink the medicine. About an hour later, I start purging. And you're going to purge if you take ayahuasca. So I purge for a little bit. And then I start seeing these geometrical patterns, which I thought were like so cool. And then all of a sudden... The medicine tells me that my neighbor is under a lot of lot of stress. And my reply was, I don't give a damn. <laughs> and the reason why is because I'm here for me. I'm not here for my neighbor. And this was so confusing to me because me and this neighbor, I may talk to her via text probably once every six months if something major happens in the neighborhood. And I may see her once or twice a month when she's outside or whatever. So it's not like this is a person that I know anything really about I don't know what's going on with her personal life so the medicine is persistent telling me that my neighbor's like stressed out and it says that I need to write her a letter I'm like write her a letter what the hell I look like just writing my, my neighbor a random letter that I rarely talk to and the medicine tells me what to write in the letter and I remember what it told me to say after the medicine tells me to write this letter and I agree to it it then says give her $500 and I'm like, hell no, I'm not giving some woman that I barely know $500. And as soon as I give pushback to Mother Aya, she throws me into a haunted house with clowns chasing me. And I'm like, okay, 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 I'll give her the $500. Like, get me the hell out of here, right? So, so this is my first experience with Mother Ayahuasca, where it's focusing on my neighbor and throws me into a haunted house with clowns chasing me. So I'm like, oh my goodness, I have to deal with this for two more days. Oh, and I forgot to mention, this is the 
story that's going to be in the upcoming book. So you're hearing part one now, and then you're going to hear the second half when I get back home. So after I agree to write in the letter and give my neighbor $500, the medicine says, if I don't do this, my neighbor is going to commit suicide. And not only does it tell me that she's going to commit suicide, it shows me how she's going to do it. And it ain't pretty. And then once I see her commit suicide, I'm laying on my mat, just crying and grieving. And I'm not crying because my neighbor committed suicide. I'm crying because her child is no longer going to have their mother in their life. So after grieving for um, her, uh, uh, grieving her, for, grieving for her child for a bit, I get myself together. I'm like Nathan. Mother Nature makes no mistakes. So I started to get some composure and I was okay with it, but I was like, I will do what Mother Aya asked me to do. I'll write her a letter, give her $500. So after that, I'm back at peace. I'm seeing these geometrical patterns. And then all of a sudden, my stomach starts rumbling like boom, 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 boom. So I sit up off my mat and I'm like, oh snap, I gotta poop. But at this point in time, I am heavy under the medicine. I mean, I am heavy under the medicine where there was no way I can walk to the entrance of the Maloka. Not only could I not walk over to the entrance, I couldn't even crawl over there. So I'm like frantic, like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm about to poop on myself. So I squeeze my butt cheeks as tight as I possibly can. And while I'm squeezing my butt cheeks, I'm looking around hoping that a facilitator sees me that I'm like frantic. So I'm like this. <laughs> and nobody's looking at me. So I couldn't say help, come over here and help me because I'm at a silent retreat. So there's no talking. Now you can cry, you can growl, you can laugh, but there's no talking. So I'm there holding my butt cheeks as, as strong as possible. And let me tell you this. I've never been a volcano, but I sure as hell knew what it felt like when it was about to explode because that's what I was feeling. I just had this pressure on the back side of me, like, let me out. So after about 10 seconds, I hear this voice. You're going to poop on yourself. And then I hear another voice. You're going to have to ask them to clean your underwear. And another voice. You're going to be the first person that poops on themselves. Another voice. You're going to have to ask them to clean your sleeping bag. And I start hearing these voices and they start coming together like a course. We're told that we could only have one thought at a time. No, I was hearing all of these voices at the same time and it was getting louder and louder and louder. It was as if I was in a box and a bunch of people were screaming at me and I'm like this. <laughs> I'm gonna poop on myself. I'm gonna poop on myself. I'm gonna poop on myself. Like, I'm getting frantic, okay? I'm getting seriously frantic. And I do Kegel exercises every day. Kegel exercises does not help out with butt muscles. So, in this moment of straight up frantic, I decide to get on my mat and lay on my stomach. And I decide to lay on my stomach because I'm thinking that gravity is going to help keep my poop down. So I'm like, I'm about to get on my stomach and I'm going to squeeze my butt muscles as strong as I can and stop this thing from exploding. So I turn over on my mat and while I'm on my stomach, I still hear these voices yelling at me and making fun of me that I'm going to poop on myself. And I'm on my mat like this. <laughs> I'm going to poop on myself. I'm going to poop on myself. And I'm freaking going ape shit crazy, okay? Like literally. And I realized that I can't keep this up. I can't keep having these voices yell at me in my head. I can't keep on holding my butt muscles because I've been holding it already for a couple of minutes and I'm getting weak. So I'm like, you know what? I can't win this battle. So I wave the white flag. I let my butt cheeks go. And all of a sudden, That's all it was. It was just a little old fart. I was like, Mother Aya, you so funny. You had me thinking I was about to explode on myself and all it was was poo. And I was just like laughing for like the last 10 to 15 minutes because 
I've never been that frantic in my life. And one of the fears that I had before trying ayahuasca was the fact that I might poop myself. So, yeah, yeah. And then a couple of times later on that evening, I had the same feeling come up in my stomach and I felt the pressure on my backside, but I just relaxed and it was just poop, poop. That's all it was. And for the rest of the night, I just laid on my mat and mother ayahuasca is known to be this feminine energy and you can feel the feminine energy where i felt like i was being loved and hugged by the medicine so that was all that happened the first night so after that was over over i went back to my cabin and in the morning the facilitators come to your cabin to ask you what you experienced how was it did you have any questions so when they came to my cabin I did not tell them about my neighbor committing suicide because that just seemed so like far-fetched and I didn't feel comfortable talking about it. But I did tell them about the pooping situation and they said that that was going to teach me how to surrender. Not only was it going to teach me how to surrender, but it was going to help me overcome any fear I might be experiencing in my life. And when they said that, I'm just like, I really don't understand how <laughs> me pooping is going to correlate to me overcoming fear in my personal life, but I just said, okay. So the second night comes around and before we drink the medicine, the shaman puts out an intent for everyone. And she says that we're going to focus on healing with the first relationship we've ever been in. And that's the relationship with our parents. And I'm thinking in my head, I don't need any healing. I forgave my dad for what he did. Me and my mom are cool. Like I need to focus on my intention on why I came here. So I drink the medicine. Now, before I go over my experience, I have to give you this backstory. So when I was nine years old, I was over my dad's house and my parents were divorced at this time. So I went over his house every other weekend and it was a Sunday and my dad, wasn't home and what I was doing while I was in his house I was going through his pockets just being a nosy little kid so I was just going through all his little pockets and then his one jacket I went in there I pulled something out and it was a bunch of little small baggies with white substance in it and as soon as I saw it I knew it was drugs I initially thought it was coke but I actually found out later on that it was heroin I had no idea that you can snort heroin so as soon as I saw the drugs I put it back in the pocket and then I wrote my dad a letter on a brown paper bag with a purple marker. And I said, dear dad, I found your drugs. That's up. You chose drugs over your family. Love Nathan. And I knew my mom was going to be coming to pick me up pretty soon. So I waited for my mom to come before I left the letter. And once my mom came and the fact that my dad wasn't home, I left the letter. So I got in the car with my mom. I told my mom that I found my dad's drugs. And she said, I knew that you were gonna find out that your dad was addicted to drugs at some point in time. I just didn't know you were gonna find out so soon. So I get home and later that evening, the phone rings. My mom picks up the phone and she yells downstairs to me, Nathan, your dad's on the phone. I'm like, I know he found my letter but I knew this was a conversation that needed to be had. So I walk, walk over to the phone, I pick up and I say, hello. And all I heard was click. That was the last time my dad ever reached out to me. There were no more happy birthdays. I miss you, Merry Christmas, none of that. And I grew up from the age of nine up until the age of 17 having this sense of abandonment, not being loved by my dad. And um, when I was 17 years old, my cousin said, hey, Nate, you should go see your dad because the drugs are starting to play a toll on him. And I'm like, no, no, I don't want to go see him. He, he left me. He doesn't want anything to do with me. So no, I don't want to see him. And she said, I'll go with you. I was reluctant, but I was like, okay, cool. I'll go with you. 
So we go over, uh, we go to see him and I knock on the door. He opens the door and he says, what's up? And he says hi to my cousin and starts walking away. He didn't recognize I was his son. He thought I was my cousin's boyfriend. And my cousin's like, Roosevelt, this is your son. He was like, oh, 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 hey, hey, how you doing, Nathan? So it was just this, it was just this like, like pain in my heart from that situation. And um, we sat down on the porch and we talked and I asked my dad straight up, why didn't you reach out to me all those years? And his reply was, why didn't you reach out to me? And I said, I was a child, you're the adult. And he just said, you're right. And that was it. So from that point on, me and my dad did have some type of relationship where I would call him on Father's Day, his birthday, Christmas. Like we had a relationship, but it wasn't like a close bond. But um, yeah, so that's the backstory with my father. And that's important for you to know that with what I'm about to share. So I drink the medicine and about an hour later, I appear in a hospital and it's as vivid and as real as this moment is right here. I'm in the hospital and I see my mom on a hospital bed and she's smiling, looking all cheerful and she's much younger too. And I'm like so confused what's going on in this situation. I'm just like, this is weird. <laughs> and then this nurse walks over to me with a baby in her hand and she says, here's your son. And this is when I realized I was in my dad's body. And I was in his body and I remember him looking at me for the first time. And I could feel how proud he was to be my dad. I could feel this abundance of love that he had for me. I felt the joy that I gave him. The feeling a man has at looking at his child for the first time is nothing that could be matched on this planet. There's no pleasure, no nothing that can top it. And I was feeling my dad's emotions in this moment. And while I was feeling his emotions, I could just feel like the abandonment, the resentment, the anger that I had towards him just started leaving my body. And like I cried and cried for like straight 30 minutes, like boo hoo went on my mat, just tears coming down my face nonstop because I realized that my dad loved me. He just had an addiction. Not only did he just have an addiction, but consciousness wanted to experience what it was for someone to be addicted to heroin through my dad. It wasn't my dad's fault. It's just what the universe wanted, wanted to happen. So after like boohooing on my mat, having this healing from my father that I didn't even know I needed healing from. Like I'm thinking I'm okay. I said I forgave him, but I didn't really forgive him in my heart. And I've never had a child, but I now know how it feels for a man to see their child and the love that you can have for that person. It's, it's unmatched. So after that happened, I'm thinking like, wow, mother ayahuasca is amazing. Like I never thought that I was going to come here and have this type of healing. And I'm on the mat for a little bit and I start seeing the geometrical patterns. And then all of a sudden the medicine takes me to when I was seven years old. So I was seven years old over my dad's place and my parents were still divorced. But this time it was during the week and it was during the week. And it's crazy because I remember this stuff. This happened when I was seven years old, but I was over his house during the week because my mom got in a car accident and she was no longer to take, take me to school. And the school was right by my father's house. 
So while I was at my dad's house playing outside, I see this woman walking up the street. And I thought it was my woman, I thought it was my wife, my wife. I thought it was my mom, but I wasn't sure because she was too far away. So I'm still playing outside, keeping my eye on this person. And as she's walking up the street, I realize it's my mom. I'm like, mom. And I run down to my mom and she's wearing this black skirt. And I just hug her. I just hug her around her legs. And the only thought I had when I was hugging my mom was that I love this woman. I love my mom. That was the only thought that was in my mind when I was seven years old. And the reason why this was so significant for me because as a 39 year old man, I would criticize my mother. I would want her to change her ways to be the way I wanted her to be. I was not loving her unconditionally like I did when I was seven years old. And I felt like sh because I was thinking about all the things that I did to my mom, how I treated her, the things that I said to her. But when I was seven years old, I just loved her for who she was. And I don't know what happened in my life for me to change the way I love my mom, but I knew it wasn't right. So after having that moment of being in my seven year old self and having and seeing the unconditional love that I had for my mom, I realized I will never ever in my life, not only say anything negative about my mom, but I can't even think of anything negative because I got back to that seven year old self of loving my mom unconditionally. And I'm just on my mat. <laughs> boo-hooing again, crying my eyes out in amazement that the medicine allowed me to have this realization of showing me what unconditional love is and just, and just realizing how much I've changed as a person from who I was when I was this child. So after that night, I go back to my cabin and I'm feeling like a new person. Like, I'm not thinking that I need any healing whatsoever. So I go back to my cabin. The next morning, the facilitators come to my cabin and they're like, how'd it go? And they can instantly tell, like, I had a breakthrough. I'm like, let me tell you what happened. And I tell them what happened. And even though my dad is no longer alive, like, I have the best relationship with my dad now and like he doesn't need to be here for that to happen. So I tell them what happened with my dad and my mom and a facilitator says that is going to help balance your masculine and feminine energy. And I'm like, okay, like whatever y'all say, because I'm like so appreciative of mother ayahuasca. So yeah. So now I'm going to go over day three. But first, I want to let you know that this channel is all about living a conscious life. And if you're about that life and you're vibing with me, subscribe to the channel. Okay, so the third day. Third day, I'm like, yo, my life has changed around. I'm no longer worried about my intention to be met because I'm like, whatever mother ayahuasca wants me to experience, I'm just going to surrender and accept it because I'm already feeling like a new person. So I drink the medicine about an hour in the medicine takes me to when I was 10 years old, when I experienced my childhood trauma. And I'm not going to go over that with you in this video. And the only reason why not, is because I mentioned it or I go over it in my previous video. And I go into detail of my trauma dealing with my mom's boyfriend. And I'll link that video in the description so you can watch it after this video. 
But yeah, I share with you how Mother Ayahuasca helped me be become aware how that one event in my life was influencing the last 29 years of my life and I was unaware of it. So after I get closure with my childhood trauma, I'm like, man, this is freaking phenomenal. Like, oh my goodness, like nothing else needs to happen. I am a changed man. So I'm laying on my mat, just feeling so grateful and just, just baking in bliss. And then all of a sudden, this energy from my sacrum starts radiating through my body, this masculine energy. And while this masculine energy is radiating throughout my entire body, my skin is burning like fire. And I start getting like really aggressive like an animal. I'm like, <sighs> like I am straight up raging. Like I am vibrating that entire maloka. Something was coming out of me that I did not know that was in me. It felt like my skin was burning and I was transforming into a werewolf. And I was doing this for about a good five to six minutes. And after I finished raging and after my skin stopped burning, I settled down. And I had this realization that that was my initiation to transformation from being a boy to a man. And I don't have any shame of saying it. I became a man at 39 years old. My life has been that changed that I will tell anybody in a heartbeat, hell, I'm putting it on YouTube. I became a man at 39 years old. And I just felt like this new person, like totally transformed. So I'm just laying on my mat and just looking at the stars and I remember tears just coming down the side of my face. And after the ceremony was over, I went back to my cabin. I woke up the next morning and like I wasn't the Nathan that I knew. I was literally a new person and I left that retreat and I knew I need to do two things. Number one, I need to go see my mom. And number two, I needed to write that letter and give my neighbor that $500. So, man. So before I go home, I stop over my mom's house and I knock on her door. So I knock on her door and I hear her voice before she opens the door. And I start getting emotional. Like I start feeling my heart beat all quickly. I'm like, oh my goodness. And my mom opens the door. I walk in and I just give my mom this big hug. And I'm just telling her that I just love her. I love her. I love her. I love you. I love you. And I'm telling my mom that I just became a man at 39. And she's like, no, you've always been a man. And I'm like, no, I just became a man at 39 years old. And I'm just hugging her. And while I'm hugging her, I'm thinking about that seven-year-old me hugging her when I saw her at the bottom of the street. And it was just this real emotional moment for us because we, we haven't hugged like that in years. I don't even remember the last time I hugged my mom like that. So I leave my mom's house and then I go to the ATM to get the $500. So I get the $500 and I, I, I don't reach out to my neighbor because it's already pretty late. So I go home, I go to sleep, and I wake up in the morning, and the first thing I think about is, man, I ain't giving her ass no damn $500. Man, I'm gonna give her $300. She's gonna appreciate $300. What the hell I look like? And I'm like, you know what? No, nope, no, nope, Nathan, your life is that change. Follow through with giving her the $500. So I'm like, okay, bet. I'm gonna give her the $500. But I knew that my heart wasn't fully in it because I had some resentment with giving her the $500. So I came into this room and I meditated.
for a long time. I meditated and meditated and meditated because I wanted to make sure when I gave her that $500, it came from a place of love and compassion. And then after meditating for a while, I came to this realization that the universe allowed me to have this $500, not just to spend on myself, but for it to be a blessing for someone else. So once I got to that place of being like a pure, like love, I was like, okay, I could give it to her now. So I get a sheet of paper off my printer and I write the letter that mother Aya told me to write. Neighbor, I want you to know you are doing an amazing job raising your child. I know it's hard at times, but I want you to know your child chose you to be their mother because they knew you were going to be the best mom in the world. Thanks for being a great neighbor. This is from the universe. So I stick in the money, I fold up the paper, and then I call my neighbor up and I'm like, hey, uh, can I give you something? I know she's probably like, man, this dude crazy as hell. I'm like, hey, can I give you something? And she's like, yeah, sure. So she said, I'll text you when I'm about to take my child to daycare. I was like, okay, bet. So she texts me, I walk across the street, I give her the letter and she's like, what's this? I was like, it's something from the universe. She's like, okay. So I walk back over to my house and about an hour later, she texts me and the text said, thank you for, uh, thank, thank you for making me cry this morning. This letter meant more than anything, even more than a gesture. And I was like, okay, you're welcome. And that was it. Again, we don't talk to each other that often. So a week late, a week and a half later, she texts me and says, hey, would you like to walk around the neighborhood? I'm like, yeah, sure. So we're walking around the neighborhood. Oh, oh, I forgot to mention this. So as, as soon as we meet outside, she says again, thank you so much for that letter. You just don't know how much that meant to me. I was like, you're welcome. So we're walking around the neighborhood and we're just talking about how things have been. And I told her that I tried Mother Aya and I had no intention on telling her like my experience with the medicine, but she asked me. So she's like, hey, how was that experience with that medicine that you tried? And I tell her the entire story that I share with you, but I did not tell her the part about me seeing her commit suicide because it felt kind of weird telling some person I'm not even close with that I saw you commit suicide. So I didn't say anything to her, but after going through everything, it was just something on my conscience where it's like, like tell her. So I gave her a heads up. I'm like, hey, I'm about to share something with you. It's going to sound crazy, but I just want to make sure I tell you everything. So, and then I tell her like, hey, the medicine told me that you were under a lot of stress. Not only did it tell me that you were under a lot of stress, but it showed me you committing suicide. And while we're walking, she stops and says, That Aya stuff really shows you that? I was like, yeah, it did. I know it's crazy. I'm sorry. I just wanted to be honest with you with the experience. And she says, No, it's not crazy at all. Because I've been thinking about committing suicide. I haven't told anyone this because I've been fearful that they may take my child from me. And that's why I told you that that letter meant more than any meant more than anything and at this point i'm in complete disbelief like how in the world did the medicine know to use me as a vessel to potentially help someone from help someone save their life like you can't make this up so yeah so this is a story that's going to be in the upcoming book and like I said, it is something extremely rare because usually the medicine focuses on the individual. It, it usually doesn't focus on someone else. So yeah, um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just like extremely thankful. So what I wanna to talk to you about next is the changes I've been able to sustain over the last 10 months after experiencing Mother Aya. And the first thing is, I started this YouTube channel a week after leaving the retreat and 
I was supposed to start this channel last year, but I was fearful of the prospect of public failure. But now, I don't give a damn what anyone thinks. If you were to just start living your life not caring about the opinions of others, you would have a totally different life. That pooping incident on day one helped me eliminate my fear, pun intended. Number two, I gave up my nightly dessert, which was cannabis and drinking wine. And I had no intention to ever give it up. I just had, like all of a sudden, I no longer had the urge for it. And I think, I think it's because I was using cannabis and drinking as a coping mechanism. And once I had all of this healing in my life from my, my parents and my childhood trauma, my body no longer needed those substances as a coping mechanism. Number three, I've stopped sleeping around with women. It's now more important for me to share my energy consciously. And this is actually the longest I've gone without having sex since I was 16. I am like a new age 40 year old version, okay? <laughs> and number four, I have more love and compassion for others where I no longer get mad because I know people are just acting out based on their subconscious programming just like I was. If you watched the video on my childhood trauma, that'll really help you understand where I'm coming from. And again, I'll link that video in the description. So this was my experience with Mother Aya and I would have to say my life has forever been changed. She gave me exactly what I needed. And if it's meant for you, she'll call you. But if you have any questions about the medicine or have any questions uh, for me, comment below and let's just not get old together. Let's grow together. Bye for now.